Welcome to another edition of the Business Brands and the Bottom Line Podcast. My name is Paul Delegro, your host, and my guest today is Sean Barnes, the founder and principal of WSS Solutions. Welcome to the show, Sean. I'm really looking forward to this conversation, Paul. We've talked a little bit about technology and a little bit about entrepreneurship, and I just can't wait to dive in. Yeah, so you've got an interesting background. You know, you were an IT nerd for like a million years, <laughs> and you kind of have you've morphed into a kind of more leadership roles. So tell me about that journey a little bit. We can, as we go along with this, we can kind of dig in deeper. But I thought that was fascinating because I think a lot of people, they get into a role and they think that's it for life, right? They can't change. So, yeah, you know, that's such a good point because, well, growing up, technology always just came easy to me and it made sense to step into a technology role right out of college, started out on a help desk and then PC hardware and kind of grew in systems admin, engineer, manager, director, and ultimately VP of IT. Yeah. Now that time frame that it took to get there was probably 15 years to kind of progress. But even in my director and VP roles of technology, I was still this introverted IT nerd. I didn't really interact with people in the business, didn't really talk to a whole lot of people. And the company that I was working for at the time, we had had some challenges with turnover and senior HR leadership. And in four years time, we had four VPs come and go. And after the final one departed, I raised my hand and said, I'd like the opportunity to lead HR. Now there were some drivers behind that because I, I had accomplished a lot of the things that I wanted to accomplish in my career when it came to technology, but what I didn't really feel was fulfillment. Yeah. I was struggling with that, and I didn't know why, and ultimately realized I just needed to be challenged, and I thought, hey, leading HR, that would be a challenge. So some back and forth occurred with myself and the CEO. Ultimately, I convinced her to, to, to let me try. And I was just transparent and said, I don't know employment law. I don't know payroll processes or benefits, but I know structure. I know how to improve processes and I know how to bring teams together. And I said, can you give me a year? Let me just try to bring this HR team together to better support the business. And I, I truly think that it was really, hey, it can't be any worse than what we've had. So let's just go ahead and give it a try. And technology was running pretty good good for us at that point in time. What, what year was this, by the way, Sean? This was 2015, 16 time okay, frame. So not that long like ago. That. Okay. So not that long ago. Okay. And so I stepped in and started leading human resources. And Paul, it was like drinking from a fire hose. It was just completely challenged me and pushed me to my limits. Now, I, I have to give a special shout out to our then infrastructure manager, who then turned into director and, and VP of IT. Had he not been such a crucial part of the team and been able to step up and start leading the IT team, I'm not sure I would have been as successful in also leading human resources. And when I had that opportunity to start leading HR, I came to realize how important and fulfilling it is to start investing in others. Yeah. And while I had accomplished all of these things in my career, I realized that all of those goals I had set were intrinsically driven. They were very focused on me. What could Sean accomplish? And when I started leading HR and leading HR and IT, I, I found that fulfillment that I was seeking. Nice. Started building up the people in the HR team and then I continued building the people in the IT team. Fast forward to three and a half years ago, and they also gave me safety, transportation, PMO, and ESG. Yeah, so you weren't and busy is what you're trying to do. Not at all. No, 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 no. <laughs> and you know what's funny? Actually, whenever I present at conferences and events, people will come up afterwards and say, how on earth do you do all of that? And initially, my response was, well, a lot of caffeine, but really. But I've come to recognize that ultimately, and this is my response now, is I don't. 
What I do is build leaders, and those leaders, the VP of IT, the VP of HR and safety and transportation, I empower them, I build them so that they know how to be successful, so that they can successfully build and lead their teams. And what that affords is the opportunity for me to kind of dive in and out to yeah. each functional domain or silo to be able to help where needed. And it's given yeah. me exposure to people in the business, so that I can learn and even add more value. Yeah. So that tells me you're a very secure person. And the reason why I say that is, you know, you find these leaders that want to control everything. Mm -hmm. to, to me, that's a sign of insecurity. It so is. If you, if you surround yourself with talent, what was the old saying? You know, hire people that are smarter than you. Oh, yeah. Right. Absolutely. So it makes you look good. I, I had a boss say that to me once. He goes, always remember one thing. Try to make me look good as best you can because if you look good, I look good, and we all look good. So we all win. So that's kind of, you know, yeah. not exactly what you're saying, but it, it's similar, right? Well, I see that a lot. Whenever I've started to, well, since shifting into a focus of building leaders, I've seen people that kind of progress. Maybe they're the, they were the best systems engineer. They step into a manager role, and they're leading engineers, but... They try to control, they get into the weeds, they keep doing all of that stuff. And some people are more receptive to this feedback than others. But what I always share with them is that when you step into a leadership role, it is no longer about how much Sean can output. It's how can Sean empower others to become a force multiplier? I need to make sure that Jason and Sally and Tom are all outputting as much as they can right. and that their teams are outputting as much as they can. And you see leaders that will make the comment or statement of, well, if I'm not doing these things, then I can lose my job. Right. And and you have to shift that perspective to one of, I'm going to help all of these people be successful. And if I'm good enough to help them be successful, it then frees me up to go focus yeah. on even more areas. So you have to come at it with this abundance mindset of there's always going to be more problems for me to solve. Yeah, hundred percent. I completely agree with that. I mean, if you look at, look back at your life. We've all had a number of different managers and leaders that we've worked with and for. And I can go back, I won't name names, of course, but I can go back and maybe on one hand, maybe I can count the really good leaders. So then I, I, I did this analysis once. I said, okay, why do I consider them good leaders, right, versus the ones? And there's some commonalities between those two different groups, you know, the ones that I look back at and admire are the ones that empowered me, made me feel good about myself, gave me the tools to be successful. I felt like they supported me. They were, and I would run through a wall for these guys to this day versus the other side of that coin is the people that micromanage, the people that are very critical, the people that don't make you feel good about yourself, you know? So, I mean, expand on that a little bit. I mean, cause that's kind of my, my theory on that. I could be dead wrong, but that's just the way I feel. <laughs> No, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there, Paul. It's it's really, <laughs> I can think back to the leaders. And, it, and I, you know, when we reflect back, we always think about the, the, the extreme ends of the spectrum. Yep. I can think about the leaders that ripped me to shreds. Yep. And I think about the ones that empowered me and invested in me and gave me everything I needed to be successful. They didn't do the work for me but they empowered me and gave me the tools to be successful. So there's definitely a spectrum there. And what's important is that as we grow, we learn from both sides of the yeah. spectrum. I, I learned these are the traits that I admire and respect, and that's the type of leader I want to be. These are the traits that made me go home and cry at night. I don't want to be <laughs> that leader. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's all, all, all good points. Um, so as you, as you've made your transition from you know techno geek to leadership, uh, what were the biggest challenges for you? Because we all think we'd be great leaders, and then when we become one, it's like okay, this is a little different than I thought it would be. Right? Yeah, and that is a great question, and I've I've reflected on this quite a bit, really more in recent years, because whenever I was in the middle of learning all of this stuff, I didn't really have time to step back and reflect. But one of the challenges that I did struggle with was wearing my IT hat, then my HR hat, then my IT hat. Now, you and likely your listeners are all very comfortable and aware that 
the technology realm is hyper focused on data, logic, numbers, facts. That that's just how it works. When you step into the HR and people realm, it's all 3000% emotion, 2000% of the time. And so you have to figure out how to transition from dealing with data logic facts to all emotion. Yeah. I struggled with that. I, I truly imagine. did because yeah. I would step in and a lot of the people on the HR team were just hyper emotional. And I had never had visibility into that side of HR before. Yeah. It's always like, oh, HR is coming. I'm in trouble mindset. But whenever you start working with HR professionals, and uh, I mean, there's reasons behind it, but they usually have a tendency to be more emotional, more reflective. They get frustrated. They, it, it just, it, it is a chat. It's a different subset of personalities you have to deal with. Now, one of the things that, I came to recognize, and this this sounds funny whenever I share it with most people, but your listeners might get a kick out of it and it might resonate with them. The hugest turning point that I had was whenever I figured out how to view people as data sets. And by that, I mean, Jason has a wife and kids. I know he enjoys fishing on the weekends. I know he has this hobby. I know he has a tendency to get a little bit hot headed, but I also know how much he cares. I know what he's strong in. I know what he's weak in. And what you do is the more you learn about these people, you can start building this digital profile in your mind of this individual and this individual and this person. Once you start building these digital profiles and viewing them in that way, then you know what motivates and drives Jason. Are there opportunities within the organization to align him with those things that he's passionate about, that he gets excited about? Are there opportunities to align Sally with the things that she enjoys? Yeah. And when you're in a leadership role, that's how you have to approach these situations and leading these people, understand what drives and motivates people, understand what the business needs, and then create that alignment every chance you get. You can't always get 100% of the way sure. there. But if you can get 80, 90% of the, the team in roles they love, watch their output skyrocket, their, their loyalty to you, their appreciation to you for creating opportunities for them. And it's really not you creating the opportunity as much as you identifying the opportunity yeah. and creating that alignment. Yeah, great, great points, by the way. So I know recently you started your own venture. What? Tell us a little bit about that, because I know this all ties together, mm -hmm. right? It does. About leadership and, 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 uh, and entrepreneurship and, and all mm -hmm. that. So wh what's going on with you now? Yes. So a little bit of backstory. Right out of college, I had two failed attempts at starting a company. I've just always had this entrepreneurial spirit, wanting to, to build a company, build a team. And those two ventures obviously failed. One was a computer repair company and the other was an automotive speed shop just because I like racing cars. And after a year and a half of trying to make those individually work, I wasn't doing them both at the same time. It just neither got traction and I had to pay bills and pay student loans. And so I just went and got a job. But I've always had this fire inside of me to do that. Now, eventually, back in 2007, I found myself in the oil and gas industry. And no, the companies no, that I've from an IT standpoint, you were an IT. I was still point. IT. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I've been in IT this entire time, all the way up to 2007. And I started working for an oil and gas company who was highly acquisitive. We had made 14 acquisitions when I started. By the time I left, I think we were at like 38, 39 acquisitions and integrations. So I got exposure to a lot of technology platforms and, and had the opportunity to build a new data center environment, which was very exciting and fulfilling for me at that point in my career. The reason I share all of that is because when you are dealing with acquisitive companies, you get the opportunity to get exposure to entrepreneurs. And when you spend time with them, you're able to kind of pick up on some of the challenges that they endured, some of the adversity, how they overcame it. And the last company that I was with for the past decade, also very acquisitive, got to spend even more time with entrepreneurs. So 
all that time, I was like a sponge soaking up information on what they did right, what they did wrong. And about a, a year ago, I came to the realization that I can do this. I know I can do it. I have to try one more time. I cannot be in my 60s and retire and have to live with that regret. Yeah. And I've had conversations with mentors of mine, and some of them kind of jokingly say, well, there's nothing wrong with a 60-year-old consultant. Well, that's not what I want. I don't want to be just a consultant. Right. I want to be able to build something. And so I'm still young enough to have the energy necessary to create something new, but I'm at a point in my life and career where I have amassed all of these skills and learned so much, and I think I can provide value to our customers by sharing that knowledge and helping them grow and scale their businesses. So I made the decision just a couple of weeks ago to go out on my, well, I made the decision last year, but a couple of weeks ago, officially transitioned out into leading my own company. And we focus on people, processes, and technology very intentionally in that order, because I'm a firm believer that for any organization, you have to have the right people on the bus and the right people in the right seats on the bus. Back to our, our previous conversation. Once you have the right people involved, then you focus on the processes of the business itself. You streamline those processes. You, you figure out what is the optimal way for us to deliver our product or service to the, their customers. And then you bring in technology on the back end. And because of my experience over the years, I've seen a lot of business leaders and entrepreneurs, they focus on, well, this ERP system is going to fix all my problems. Well, it's not. Technology is technology. It's increasingly becoming right. commoditized. And there's nuances between each platform, obviously. But if you don't have the people and processes right first, it doesn't matter what technology you throw at it, you're going to struggle. So, yes, our, our company now is called WSS Solutions, which stands for Wolf Strategic Systems and Solutions. But that was a little bit long. So and is that so the, is that the uh the logo you have behind well, you or is that so this is the logo for my podcast just okay. the way of the wolf and the podcast is actually focused on leadership entrepreneurship and becoming the best version of ourselves started the podcast a couple of years ago just to try to get out of my shell get comfortable behind a camera and microphone and uh and then my company wolf strategic systems and solutions there's a little bit of a theme there sure so, <laughs> no it's funny uh, you, you just raised a good point um I started this podcast, I think, about the same time you started yours. And mm -hmm. like all of us, I was never comfortable in front of a camera mm. or speaking in front of groups. I did it, but I've never got – I will say this. The podcast has definitely gotten me out of my shell a little bit. Yeah, and, and whenever I share the story about starting the podcast, there was actually two reasons. One was to get out of my shell, to get more comfortable having conversations with people because I knew – to be able to achieve the impact that I wanted to have in this world, I was not going to be able to do it from my keyboard in my office. Yeah. I was going to have to figure out some sort of medium I could leverage to share the lessons that I've learned with the world. And I don't monetize a show, never going to monetize a show. That's not the intent behind it. It's truly just to try to help people out. And that was the other reason, because I wanted to be able to share the lessons I've learned and figure out how to help as many people as possible. Not to say it's going to accelerate the timeline for progressing through their career, but my hope is that if I can share some of the the speed bumps and pitfalls that I've encountered and share how I was able to overcome them, they're still going to encounter them, but maybe, just maybe, they'll be able to call back on something that they heard on the show mm -hmm. and think, maybe I approach it this way. And if it can help them solve those problems faster, then it's worth it. Yeah, and 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 obviously we do this because we we're passionate about it, right? So you you obviously have you enjoy what the podcast as well. It's not just a we all want to help people too, but you've got to get something self satisfaction out of it as well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I, you know it's funny. I was having just that same conversation a couple of days ago with a friend of mine who's who has a, he has a coaching business in the fitness realm, and we were talking about how. Interesting it is that it can be so fulfilling helping others, but there's also an element of self-serving because it makes me feel good yeah. to help others. 
but it it just it feels more fulfilling and long lasting helping others than it does me achieving something and buying a new Corvette or something like that. That's very short lived, materialistic, yeah. and admittedly, Paul. Whenever I started making more money in oil and gas, probably a decade ago, I went a little crazy buying cars and motorcycles and all the things. But after a few years, I recognized okay, this is Shout while it's right. fun, it's very shallow and yeah. like. So I wanted to shift my purpose in life to to helping others achieve success, and I found that to be fulfilling. Yeah, you found your calling, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So getting back to your business a little bit. So you do have a unique background. When you think about it, not many people have an IT background with an HR background, right? So mm -hmm. I think it's a nice combination. Mm -hmm. So do you have a formal program in place? Like when you approach companies, they always, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in sales, right? So mm -hmm. I always wonder, you know, what's our offering? What can we offer a company that mm -hmm. it differentiates us from the next guys? Because, mm -hmm. you know, how many times have you heard someone say, well, the last 10 guys that were in front of me said the same thing. We're different, yep. right? Yep. So what are your differentiators? Like what, what, what consulting services do you offer that are different than everyone else's? Yeah, that, that is a good question. And, you know, since this is new to me, Paul, I'm very comfortable in operating all of the these domains that I work in. I have never done sales in my entire life. And so I'm working through, I actually have a book. Yeah, I've got a couple of books right here, just trying to figure out what is the best way to generate leads and turn them into qualified leads and that's actually tough. be able to close the sales. When it's, you get that not figured a, out, let me know. Because, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that's... So I, that, Hardest part of sales, it's not that you don't have a great offering or our mm -hmm. company, Prescriptive Data Solution, doesn't have a great offering. It's how do we get people to respond to us, right? How do you yep. get in front of customers? So that's the, you know, you're in sales now. So, you know. I am. And so he, here's here's my approach. I want to figure out how to get in front of as many eyes as possible and showcase what we do. Showcase how I can add value and our team can add value. And what... I've come to realize is that another byproduct of having the podcast is I have two and a half years of showcasing what I yes. love to do and yeah. how I'm able to help people and that I'm not in it for the money. The money will come, but I'm ultimately in it to try to help people. So we'll see if it pays off, but I'm truly playing the long game of yeah. give everything away for free. And eventually people will start coming to me and saying, can I pay you for very targeted help in my organization? And I have a few consult contractor consultants that are starting to work with me now. And whenever I talk to them about going in and giving a presentation for an hour or two or more to an organization and not charging them for it, just doing leadership development, yep. they kind of like, wait, really? You're going to be spending time just giving away stuff? Yep. And Paul, where my head is at, again, I'm betting on myself. This is going to be a long game. It's not good. Some people will try to take advantage of that, and that's okay. If I'm able to help people on their team, fantastic. But if I can get in the door, if I go give 10 hours of presentations and I land one client that we work with for six months. Well worth it. I mean, well, well worth it. No, I think so my approach is just get in front of as many, as many eyes as possible and try to help them out and just show them what we can do. Yeah, no, that's a great strategy because similar to us, we we do something similar. In other words, when we engage with a customer, we don't, like lawyers, say, hey, we, you owe us X amount of dollars per hour. We invest in our customers. We say, look, mm -hmm. we're going to come in and do an assessment, do some things to just kind of prove what we can do to you. Yeah. And then at that point, if we engage, then we'll work out some sort of a, a, a financial agreement. But you got to prove yourself, right? And yeah. I think that's a good strategy. Yeah. Well, and part of that proving yourself is just create the best offering possible, create an offer that people would say dumb saying no to or feel yeah. dumb saying no to. And that offer is, hey, let me come teach your people how to be better leaders and I won't charge anything. The only request I have is you provide me feedback on was it helpful? What could yeah. I do better? That's my fee. And then if we can work together, great. Yeah, that's. I think that's a healthy attitude, by the way. I yeah. think that's a yeah. Like, like, like anything else, we'll see how it goes. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're only a few weeks into this, so. Yeah. And, and here's the thing, I, as, as I'm doing more research and leaning into this approach more and more, there's, a, there are a lot of people that don't like the idea of doing work for free and it's not 
really for free. It's an opportunity to learn, grow, and build relationships. And I think a challenge that a lot of entrepreneurs run into is, well, there is an allure to entrepreneurship. It's kind of the exciting thing to do over the past few years. And people think, well, I'm going to step off and do social media, or I'm going to create this company and be a millionaire overnight. Well, that that's definitely not going to happen. And so you have to go into it with the mindset, knowing that you're not going to get paid very much at all for the first year, two years yeah. or more. What that means is you have to build a lifestyle below your means. Yes. And people run into this trap of as they progress in their career, as they build more wealth and their salaries go higher and higher, they their means and their lifestyle goes right along with it. So if uh, they're at 100000 a year, then they get a job for one fifty. All of a sudden, they bought a new boat, and they have yep. monthly payments, and they bought a new car. And so if they lose that $150,000 a year job, they start scrambling and, and freaking out. And so my approach, because I've known how long I, for a long time, I have wanted to go out and do this. So I've been living below my means for many, nice. many years, saving, 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 paying off all my debt, everything that I have. And it made it much easier for me to make that step off sure. knowing that I've got a runway of quite some time where Excellent. I can work for free. And I can focus yeah. on building relationships. Now, two years from now, if I'm still not making any money, then mm, you we'll see what happens. But it goes forever. <laughs> that's right. But no, I think that's a great mm -hmm. strategy. I, and to get back to your point about, I've always said, if you make a hundred, you're going to live to a hundred. If you make two hundred, you're going to live to two hundred. And that's a mistake people make. I remember like, I was talking to a buddy of mine. We saw one of our neighbors, new boats, new cars, new this, new that. And I know what he did for a living. And I'm scratching my head saying, how is this guy affording all this? And my buddy looks at me, he goes, he's leveraged. That's how he's affording it. He yep. owes on everything. And yep. that's never been my strategy. But I think I think you're, you're definitely approaching it the right way. I think one of the one of the biggest reasons why businesses fail is they, they don't have enough runway. They don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you set well, yourself up. Exactly. And to that point, I've been very open and communicative with my team on my consulting business. And just upfront and honest, I'm not going to pay myself anything until this company is in a good place. Yeah. I pay them really on the upper end because I want to be able to attract and retain the best talent. And I am willing to live off of my savings for a few years if I have to and not pay myself anything. Now, my CPA is kind of cringing at that, trying to figure out how we navigate that to make sure from a tax perspective, we don't trigger any sort of audit stuff. But in any event, I'm very comfortable paying myself minimum wage or whatever the minimum amount is yeah. just to ensure that the company and my team has the highest possibility of success. Nice. Well, it sounds like you're on the right track. I mean, uh, I know you just started, but, uh, uh, from what I can see, I don't know you very well, but I think I know you well enough now that I, I have no doubt that you'd be a, uh, a huge success. Appreciate and, that. And playing the long game is key. Yeah, it is. You know, and I, I don't think people have the patience to do that this day well, and age. It. You hit it right in there. If you're worried about paying bills today, you're in trouble. <sighs> oh, yeah. Because now you can't focus on the deal, the, the, you know, the, the, the uh, what's in front of you, the trying to build your business and doing it the right way, doing it the methodical, slow way. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I think that's another trap that businesses fall into of they're trying to achieve some rapid growth and they start making short term decisions when they're trying to build a long term thing. Yeah. And yes, there it's nice to be able to say, well, my business grew 100 percent, 200 percent year over year over year. OK, cool. But. As you're scaling that fast, are you putting the right systems and processes in place or are you building some sort of technological or people debt that eventually you're going to have to call on and figure out how to restructure something in your organization to then scale? And I am very comfortable playing the long game and making sure that as we grow, we're doing it right. We're doing it slow and we are setting ourselves up to best support our customers. Nice. So, well, Sean, if someone wanted to get in touch with you, if they were interested in your services, how would they do that? Yeah, definitely. You can find me on LinkedIn, Sean Barnes, or you can just go to seanbarnes.com or wsssolutions.com. And then also for the podcast, if any of you want to check that out, it's just thewaythewolf.com. 
Nice. Well, congratulations on everything. Uh, I Like I said, I, I think the podcast will help you too because I know it has helped me. So when I meet people... It seems, and I hate to say it's like I, I don't mean to like pat myself on the back, but I I think people you have instant credibility when you meet people because they say, man, you've got eighty episodes out there, uh, you must be something, whatever that something is, right? Yep. It, it adds some credibility. So, and you can just send links to people and say, here, I've, I've got a pot, and they can get to know you a little bit just by going to your pot, which I think will be a help. Yeah, well, that's such a great point, Paul, and then also. I think it was when the pandemic started, there was this massive influx of people starting podcasts. And then I saw an article at the beginning of this year showing that pod, new podcast creation was down hundreds of percentage points, something like that. And it wasn't surprising to see because people quickly realize that you're not going to get a million listeners. You're not going to be able to sell your show for $100 million. It takes time to build that up. And when you're able to consistently come out every two weeks, every single week, or whatever your interval is, on a long enough time horizon, you build credibility over time. And you also refine your delivery message. Your production quality continues to increase and when now, whenever I have conversations with people and I tell them I'm 160 episodes in, they know, okay, this isn't a fly by night guy. He's, this is something he's taken very seriously. Whereas whenever I was 20 episodes in, it was challenging to get people on the show. It was just friends that would come on. Where now you know, I people, had the same challenge. I remember when yeah. I was at show like five or six, I was trying mm-hmm. to go after some people and they're like, well, how many shows do you have? I'm like four, three, five. And they were like, Call me when you grow up. Yeah, yeah, you know? exactly. And and now that I'm 160 episodes in, people actually approach me to come yeah. on the show, which is it makes that aspect much easier. I'm not having to spend time and energy coercing and trying to convince people to come on the show. And so I have great people messaging me that you know have books coming out or they have yeah. shows or different things like that, and and it makes it much easier. So. Yeah. So that is something that speaks to the power of staying in it for the long game. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've experienced a similar situation where I, I have people contacting me, so it's kind of nice. I tell people, you know, people that just see a podcast, they see, okay, he comes out every two weeks with a half-hour show. What mm-hmm. they don't see is what it takes to get that show, you know, interviewing people, right? Like you and I had a conversation before mm-hmm. the show Yep. Last week, just to see, hey, what do we want to talk about? You know, not to script it out, but then you got mm-hmm. the time to record it, produce it, you know, support yeah. it. It's uh, not, not as easy as everyone thinks. I will say this: though, I, I read an interesting statistic. I don't know how accurate it is now, but they, they, at the time, and it's probably less now, but there's over two million podcasts in the country. Eighty percent. This is a staggering number. Eighty percent don't make it past episode three. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. That is yeah. So that tells staggering. you a lot of people get, and I know people that have started and said, this is too much work. I can't do this. <laughs> right. Well, so I have a show f- from a couple of years ago as I think it was just titled how to start a podcast, but I talked through all the tricks and the technology. And before we even started recording, we were talking about the camera that I'm just using my cell phone for this right now. Yep. You don't have to have high end expensive equipment. Yes. I've got an expensive mic, but you don't have to have that to start all of this stuff. But also I tell people, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. If you're trying to create a podcast to make money, that's not the right reason. If you are passionate about underwater basket weaving, make a show about that. And eventually people will listen. Well, they might not listen to that, but yeah. some will, but do something you're passionate. Okay. That's a, that's yeah. A new one. Yeah. It's more, uh, the, it's more malleable and easy. No, I there don't know, you go. but it's, uh, it's, if you do something that you're passionate about and you're not doing it for the money, then it will grow and it makes it easier for you to focus on it because you're doing what you love. Yeah, no, completely agree. Well, I think uh, we'll end it on that note, Sean. Uh, really appreciate you having on the show. I, I wish you the best of luck. I mean, uh, you know, I'll be following you on LinkedIn, and uh, you're in the Houston area, if I understand. Yes, sir. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, well, uh, you know, well, uh, if you're ever up in Dallas, I'm down in Houston, we'll look you up, and uh, we'll definitely go have a, a beer or something. Perfect. That sounds fantastic. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's a wrap for Business Brains and the Bottom Line. Until next time, I'm Paul Gallegory, your host. 